Thanks to Sony and uh, the team for leading us in worship this morning. It's been a good time of worship. Beautiful. Well, today I'm going to... uh, I actually reframed the heading for this particular message and uh, I thought I'd add this uh, message, the last message in the series that we've been doing, a faith that works when life doesn't. And uh, I've entitled this message as a faith that promotes a culture of honour in marriage, family and church. Now this is a big issue. You know, the, the important relationships in our lives are really our marriage, our family and our church and of course if we're out in, in terms of business or whatever, that's very important too. And these relationships should be stable relationships. Do you agree? I mean, you should... I remember when my my wife was uh, particularly talking to our kids when they were growing up, and she would say this to them, no matter what happens out there in the world, when you come home, this is the safe harbour that you can anchor in. This is where you can come, and it's safe for you. And, and, of course, when we look at it in the, in the church, in our family, uh, in our marriage, that should be the safe harbour for us when we're out in the world. This is a place where we should come back to and say, man, this is good to be here. And I hope that's true for you. But it's not true for a lot of people. And it's often been said, and I, I'm not sure whether Mark said it or someone else said it just recently, we often hurt the ones we love most. And one of the reasons for that is that we often left, let down our guard in those areas and just let it all hang out and whatever's happening in us and not finding the right way of talking about our issues so that this safety zone that we're supposed to be in actually feeds us and strengthens us to cope with life. And so this is what I'm talking about today and the sad reality may be that the intensity of the relationships that we have, they're often taken for granted. We don't take care to communicate well. And it may well be that we lack the skills to do this. And, you know, in schools, and I was a teacher for 15 years with the education department in Victoria in the secondary area, and virtually none of these skills were ever taught to people, and yet they're the most important skills for keeping a life together. And, and, and as a, a pastor and a counsellor now for 40 years, uh, I offer the following considerations for your marriage, for your family and particularly as we're in a church gathering for our church. Uh, We want to avoid the painful outcomes resulting from poor, conflictual or dysfunctional communication. So I want to share with you some principles. And, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, the Constitution, and there's three parts in all of this we've, we've come up with. We have our Constitution, which explains who we are. It has our rules as to the operation procedures, and then we'll have a leader's handbook, which will actually have all of this stuff in there that is required for us to operate well as a church. So let's, uh, if you've got your notes with you, and I hope everyone's got a set of notes, have you? Anyone not? Okay, guys down the front here, can someone grab some uh, copies up the back there because this is important material. Now there are some, just keep your hand up and if uh, you just need someone to come down with uh, copies for you. Down the front here. Two in the, two in the front here. Okay, this is good. <clears throat> Over here. Good. A couple of copies there. Okay, we're ready to go on this. Now, I'm not going to cover all of this in detail. There's a lot of material in here, but this is a teaching message where we need to take it home, read through the material, understand where we're going. There are preaching messages to inspire us. This is to correct us and, and direct us in terms of how we should behave. Now, first of all, let me say that a number of years ago, uh, Danny Silk from Bethel, uh, Bethel Church in America, had written a book called A Culture of Honour. 
And I was really taken by the title of that, so I got hold of the book and read it. And Danny was coming to our church, along with the Jesus Culture group, and uh, they were at our church. And I happened at the end of the, the weekend there, we had a, a meal for all the guys there, and I sat next to Danny and talked about his book. And I said, Danny, I, I appreciate what you've got on your book, but it's not, the book is not about the title. You've talked about a culture of honour, but what you've really done is taken the fivefold gifts of, of uh, Ephesians 4 and you've tried to get people to say, that's the honour, that we honour these positions. But I said, that does nothing. There's a preamble to all of that because that only works when there's a culture of honour for people. If you understand the difference. And we had a long discussion about that. I said, maybe you can write another book beforehand and then make it two books so that you've got the right order because the, if you're going to be saying, well, I'm an apostle and, or I'm a prophet and you're going to respect me, the fact is, if we don't respect each other, that means nothing. You follow where I'm coming from? And so this is after a lot of deliberation and mapping into this what I've learned over 40 years of counselling. This is a key to, to any relationships. So let's have a look at this. First of all, honour in the scripture. There's a whole lot of Psalms. Psalm 15.4, honour those who fear the Lord. Psalm 84.11, God bestows favour and honour on the righteous. Proverbs 13.18, those who heed correction are honoured. It goes further. Proverbs 15.33, humility comes before honour. In Proverbs 23, the honourable avoids strife. How true that is. Then honour in the New... That's the Old Testament. New Testament, Romans 12.10. Honour one another above yourselves. Whoa. 1 Corinthians 12.26. We need to honour each other, others' unique giftedness. Hebrews 13.18. Live honourably in every way. Now, we should start to see that honour is a very important word in the scripture. And we, we, we sing a song, glory and honour to God. Now, there's some key passages regarding honourable behaviour. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 9 and verse 13, it says this, Honour must characterise the church and its relationships in recognition that Christ is the head of and power of the church. Christ will judge our works and those of human origin will be destroyed by God's holy fire. You can do all sorts of things, but God basically says when you come for judgment, my holy fire will burn up the dross that's you and will only honour and reward that which was by the Spirit. This is important. And when we actually look further... Uh, Philippians 2, 1 to 15, we are to aspire to Christ's humility if we are to be honoured by him. This is important. Therefore, humbly submit to Christ's rulership without grumbling or argument. And those who do will shine like the stars in the sky. Another passage, Colossians 3, 12 to 17, I'll read it out to you. Listen carefully. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love that binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whoa, what a text. And we could unpack that for weeks, but this is your homework to take this away and say, what does God talk about in terms of honour? Now, the biblical definition of honour is to respect, 
reverence, hold in high esteem, show courteous behaviour towards, confer distinction upon and offer praise. There's a lot of things in that. But you notice it, it essentially is underpinned by the fact that we should honour each other because we are made in the image of God. We are people worthy of honour because God has made us and he doesn't make junk. And if people have struggles <coughs> and they have difficulties in their life, we still should honour those people and we should still honour people even if they cause us distress. This is what the Christian life's to be about. And if you have a faith, a real faith, as James said, without works it's dead. And the idea behind it is this, that if you need to have a faith that works when life doesn't work. Because it's got to carry you through. Now to be worthy of honour is to demonstrate integrity, high principle, morally correct behaviour, honesty, goodness, fairness, decency, righteousness, rectitude, trustworthiness, uprightness, to do what has been previously agreed to. That's honour. You know, you honour an agreement. You honour another person. Your word is your bond. You honour people by doing what you've agreed to do. Man, how many people go back to, to the wedding, you know, I love and cherish and work together and, and care for as long as we live. That's the, the pledge of marriage. I have conducted nearly 700 marriages in 40 years. That's a lot of marriages. And every one of those I gave about 12 hours counselling to, talking through this sort of stuff. And I just say to you, there are so many people, I don't know what my record's like, but I do know that, that about 40% of marriages fail. And it's not much different in the Christian church than out there in the community. And people have made vows to each other, but they don't honour them. They made vows to love and protect and care for and encourage, they don't honour them. And at the end, we need as Christians, and particularly in the church, when we honour, we want to be a member, we want to honour what's happening and leadership and other things, it's so important for us to function that honour is important. It's got to be there as one of the high things. And so when we look at that, the principle of honour, accurate acknowledgement will position me to give others what they deserve and allow us to receive the gift of who they are in our lives. In other words, the interpersonal exchange of people can only happen productively when there's honour. In a marriage, when, when they, people honour each other, and that, that underpins anything that we do in response to difficulties and pain and struggles. Same in the church. Same in our families. And I know that all of us know that there are families, churches, marriages where people have not honoured each other. So this is a big issue. So let's have a look at this a bit further. About the philosophy. What is a culture of honour? Let me cover some things, and there's a lot of stuff in this, but honour creates life-giving and life-promoting relationships. And you might notice, and I try to do this purposely, is to honour people in the church that are doing things. Honour the, the worship band, the people who put the practice in. Honour the, honor the people who preach. Honour the people who, who clean up the place and so on. Because this is what gives life when people honour each other. Secondly, it secures God's blessing and anointing because he releases his power amongst people who honour each other. And so often we say, oh, God, answer my prayer. But if we're not honouring each other, we're not honouring God, he's not going to answer. We need to understand that. It's, it's countercultural because it removes worldly cultural stereotypes. And, you know, I, what I love about this place is the variety of cultures, the, the different people that are here. It's, and, and we were talking, Ben and I were talking... 
that we've got to get a different name for Green Slopes Baptist Church. Still call underneath Green Slopes Baptist Church, but, you know, and I'm not talking about using this particular thing, but one of the, one of the tremendous names that I, and many other people have used it, but mosaic. What's a mosaic? A whole lot of broken pieces that are put together to form a beautiful picture. We need a name that basically says this is what we're trying to do and encapsulated in just one word can be the whole sort of ethos of honouring one another. And this is important stuff. Uh, This culture of honour primarily developed through leadership practice and modelling. It comes from the top down. It's a primary pathway to shalom, which is God's peace. It creates a safe place for us to experiment, to try different things. You know, uh, the only failure that we address in life is not getting up after it didn't work. Because in every failure, we learn things about ourselves, about other people, and when we take the the learnings and and not dishonour people because there's been a failure or there's been... We learn to, to actually relate as people and we benefit from any of these things. It enables us to be released into freedom requires careful governance, however, by leadership. Because I know that in any group of people, in marriages and so on, and I've had 40 years counselling in this, I know that people play games all the time. In a husband and wife, one goes silent and you can't talk about an issue. Or one never, never comes to talk about an issue, they'll talk about everything else, but they never address the issue. That is not honourable. And when people come for counselling, one of the biggest deals we've got is to make sure that people will honour each other so that when we come to agreements and when they come to processes and so on, they actually do them. Same in preaching. You know, most preachers put... Well, for every minute they preach, there's probably half an hour of work or an hour of work. And people say, oh, the sermon wasn't too good today. The fact is, whether it was good or bad, what did you find in there to put into your life so that you honour the work that a person's done? When a person holds a group together, we should honour that instead of saying, hey, it's all control, because people free to do their own thing will never form a community. There's always give and take. And so you can go on, you know, Uh, This culture of honour is offered regardless of character or behaviour of others and so removes the social game playing that happens. I remember doing a a consultancy using some of this material with with, with a very large Christian organisation that's in every state and I was called in to sort out the problems and the disagreements and struggles and I couldn't believe it because we taught about this stuff And the reality was that they went out in the morning tea time and you could hear them politically designing what they were going to say and do to to win advantage in the next session. Now, that's disgraceful. That's a Christian organisation. And it was no better than any other group, all politicking and playing games and trying to win over power. The point about it is that's got to be addressed. And I take what Mark said the other week, that we've got to speak politely. I tell you what, sometimes we've got to call to account the game players. Because you can never get a culture of honour when people are playing games and manipulating and trying to get their own particular path. This is, this is critical. And, and whilst there are views that we should be passive, I don't believe we should be passive in terms of leadership. And so this is really important. You know, transparency comes when there's a culture of honour because success and victories and all that stuff is put aside. We honour people for who they are. Uh, You know, I've I've really been impressed with Ash Barty. I think she's a really solid, strong person. You know, in success, notice, she always deflects to honour the people who have been in the other side of the net or honour the people, the team or whatever it is. And then in failure, what does she do? She says, I am not defined by tennis. Tennis is what I do. I am who I am. And my desire is to be the best person I can be, whether I win or lose, whatever. Have a look. 
And how many tennis players, young people, they want to be an Ash Barty. That's awesome. It's awesome. They don't want to be a Mick Curry, Nick Curious. They want to be an Ash Barty. Why? Because they see there's honour in that. You don't have to be afraid of losing. You'll learn from it. You're not out there to promote yourself. This is what this is about. Come to the practice now. You, you can read up the other stuff that's there. But the practice. In my relationships with my spouse, my family, my church congregation, and in life generally, I will seek at all times to offer the following. And I've listed things down. And these are the keys to honouring. And every one of those can be biblically substantiated even though I haven't put texts in there and so on. Let's run through them. What I want you to do is, as I go through these, think about what it would be like to be in a church or in a marriage or in a family where this happened. You think about it. First of all, encouragement. I will at all times seek to speak well of others and encourage them, especially concerning their giftedness, roles and ministries. Wow. How many families where there are certain members of the family who never feel encouraged? They feel put down. I had a guy come and see me over the, at the, uh, the last week. I did a lot. Of, I, I'm not sure whether I led him to Christ or whatever in the previous church, but the reality was he had mental illness and all sorts of struggles. And the hours have been put into him and by my son. But, you know, the thing about it is, while he has, still has OCD and he's got all sorts of medication he's on, the fact is when you have a, 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 an interview and a, you talk with him, he becomes quite intense about certain things. But, you know, you've got to continue to honour him. And, and I've learned a lot from this new dog we've got. I mean... I'm going to surgery tomorrow. My wife's going into surgery and we thought we'd put the dog in for surgery to take away that puppy head in his, and, and the rearrangement of our garden and eating stuff like furniture and other things. But he's a beautiful dog, highly intelligent. But the reality is he doesn't respond to aggressive control. He responds to encouragement. And when you encourage him, he behaves himself. And I always said, rehome dog, so I don't know what happened before, but we're, we're, we've got to spend a lot of time just encouraging him. Take the next one, containment. I will, apart from seeking personal confidential counsel, always seek to first address my concerns with others by directly communicating my concerns. If a person speaks to me about their concerns regarding others, I will encourage them to seek a meeting with them and offer, if necessary, to go with them for that purpose. Where does that come from, Matthew 18? That we actually address the issues, don't hide. But if you hear someone speaking badly... I mean, as a pastor of a large church, you know, I had phone calls from people who ring up and say, tell me, do you believe in the tithe? I said, well, it's in the Bible. I've got to believe in it. But I knew what they were on about. They wanted to check out whether our church was pressing the tithe. They were opposed to the tithe for their own particular purposes. And what they were going to do is then quote our church's position in trying to get some sort of leverage or opposition to our church by my answer. I had people ring up and say, what do you think about Hillsong? I said, I don't think much about Hillsong in time, but I said, they're a fantastic church doing great things. And of course, the conversation finished. Go on to the internet and have a look, Hillsong, and you'll find for every one positive, there's about 10 people opposing. And most of the opposed have never done anything in their life to build anything. That's their ministry, the ministry of nothing. And I look at that and I say, hey, we've got to get rid of that stuff. God can do whatever he wants to do through people. We've got to make sure we're doing the things that God says, not address issues with others. And we go down further. Assertiveness. 
You know, and when we talk about assertiveness, you've got to understand we're not talking about aggression and we're not talking about passivity, which are on either ends of the spectrum. Assertive aggression means I count, you don't. And on the other end of the scale, passivity means I don't count, but you do. Assertiveness is in the middle. I count and you count. So we need to make sure we're trying to address what each other needs. And so assertiveness, I will take the initiative to appropriately raise my areas of concern according to Matthew 18, believing that in so doing I demonstrate the value I place on preserving and strengthening relationships and the value God places on us each and on kingdom community. Appropriate self-disclosure. I will share with others my concerns as appropriate the content, feeling and meaning associated with my concerns. Non-defensive active listening. I'm willing to listen to others' concerns about me without defence so as to accurately understand and have verified by them that I've understood their concerns. Respect. I am for others, amidst, even amidst my concerns. I'm not against them and so will offer my respect by listening, looking, speaking, word selection... This is important. Go down further. And we're not going to cover them all, but when we go to genuineness, I will always strive to be open, transparent, and true to myself in communication. Terry and understand this. This is the stuff that he's probably on every day as a psychiatrist. Self-control. I will... Oh, this is a good one, isn't it? I will not say or do anything that will cause bad attitudes or further complicate the problems or my concerns. Well... Now, someone says something negative, we respond with a negative, they respond with a negative, and in the end, we're both going down the chute, we're not going anywhere. Honesty. I will always strive to honour my word and my, any communication I make. My yes is a yes, my no is a no, the Bible says. Empathy. I will attempt to appreciate how my how others feel and why they feel the way they do, believing that their needs are valid simply because they see them that way. How many times have you had a conversation and say, oh, yeah, you're silly thinking like that. Well, we're not addressing the concern, we're dismissing them. Let's have a listen to what their concern is and try and work out what we do with it. Conciliation, I'm willing, uh, committed to finding a workable solution or outcome to dissolve the concerns. I like this one. Growth, I'm open to help and development as I discover aspects of my thinking, behaviour and attitudes that need to change. You know, so often we know that we need to change but we reject that and we, try, we freeze up and we don't move forward. And to be honest with you, that's not an attitude of growth that will honour other people's contribution into your life. And an elegant outcome. I will always aim for outcomes from my interaction and negotiation with others that are mutually beneficial. So this is an important area. These are qualities that show that you honour other people. And if you were to take those qualities and apply them to your marriage and sit down with your partner and say, how am I going in these areas? You might get some different answers. I remember years ago, where I have a lot of questionnaires and all sorts of inventories and so on that I use in counselling. But it's interesting, when I gave stuff out to uh, various people, they go home and fill it out. And, uh, and the suggestion was, when you've filled it out, get your partner to have a look at it and see what they think about your answers. Man, that is, that is like dynamite. Anyway, this guy came back in the first week, he filled out his questionnaire and it sounded fantastic. Another guy said, oh, I think this is a load of rubbish. Because he looked at his thing and one guy had this elevated opinion of himself and the other guy, when he filled the question out, it came out to be terrible. It, you know, the, the, the assessment wasn't positive at all. And uh, he said, this is a load of rubbish. I said, well, that's fine. I mean, it may be. I don't know. But why don't you take it home and talk to your partner about it and see what their answers are? And he's never, never done that. He came back the next week with a red face and he said, whoa, 
her answers were worse than the ones that I came up with. And I've suddenly realized that I'm not the person I think I am. And you see, if we honor ourselves and we honor God in his creative uh, work and we honor other people because they're made in the image of God, when we start to address these sorts of issues, we suddenly realize we've got a lot of work to do in our lives. I've been working on this stuff for years and I've still got to work on it. And you know, one of the things that uh, I, I really found as a corrective in many ways I remember one time coming home and I was doing a huge amount of counselling as well as consulting with other churches and pastoring. But uh, I came home and there was nothing left in the tank. You ever been there where you just feel drained? There's nothing left in you? Right? They're, they're the most vulnerable times you have. And of course you, you arrive back home and there's nothing left and you've got younger kids who have made a mess or aren't doing the things you want to do and you just don't want to tolerate any more pressure in your life. You've got no more room. And so uh, I, I blew up in whatever way it was, but I remember our kids saying the end when it all quietened down. Why don't you apply... And they first you said in these words, why don't you apply the principles that you counsel with to your own children? Oh. I felt absolutely stabbed in the heart because what had happened is they always took an interest in counselling. You know, we're talking about a couple of kids that are just about teenagers and, and the issue was that they understood all this stuff. My daughter went on to do social work and counselling training and so on and ministry. She's a pastor now in the church. My son's got his PhD and he's in a major organisation in, in London working with churches in Europe. But our kids have always been reading this stuff and everything else, but they turned around and said, Dad, you're not living this out with the people who matter most to you. Wow. And it took me quite a while to get over the heart surgery needed. But this is the stuff we're talking about. And if I ask you, I mean, put your hand up if you want this church to really be a fellowship that when people come in, they feel included, they feel in, that's an open environment, that's warm and, and embracing and you feel safe here. How would you like a church like that? Man, you look at those qualities and say, well, I want that, but what does it mean? If you've got a faith that works when life doesn't, in other words, in this situation, a faith that promotes a culture of honour in marriage, family and church... What are you going to do about it? Because it's, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to actually take hold of it and start to change. And that's what we're, we're loading this for. Now let's just make a, a suggestion here. The, the issue is when we have a dispute with somebody, and this is important, if we've got things that, that we struggle with with somebody... Matthew 18 is very important, that if you don't like something, you go to that person, talk to them. If you can't, you get someone else to come with you, not to, to intervene, but a person who can give you some protection or whatever, so it can be talked about. could be a counsellor, it could be another friend, whatever it might be. But the trouble is, when you get there with the Matthew 18 thing, and you've actually come, what do you actually do when you've got to try and resolve a conflict or come to a workable solution? I've used this for years. I think it's, it's been a collection of things from the World Peace Organization, from Christian churches, from counselling and other things. But I've found this to be incredibly powerful. I'm going to go for a couple of minutes on an illustration. I had a couple that came in and they were ready to divorce. Uh, interesting situation. He was a man that was uh, involved professionally with people all day long, right? And he'd come home and he was strapped and he had no energy left in him. And, and she was a person that they had five kids under five. And all day long she's looking after kids and she is longing to have adult conversation. Do you understand what I'm talking about? If you're with kids all day, I mean... You know, you've got a, got a head spin. But the point is, you want an adult conversation. And the reality was, when he came home from work, he just wanted to disappear and not... And, and he'd come in and look at the mess around the place with five kids. It's pretty hard not to have a mess. 
And they started to be aggravated in terms of, of their relationship and it became, you know, he complained about this and she complained about that, not listening and all that stuff. And uh, we had a number of counselling sessions and then I went through this process with them about, and I'll just explain it very briefly, and I said, try this out this week, see how you go. They came back and they said, it didn't work, it didn't work, this is rubbish, right? We had this argument and it still went on and we tried to do this thing, it didn't happen. And uh, I said, well, okay, where did you start on the plan? Oh, we started on point number four. And I said, why did you start on point number four? I asked you to start on point number one and work through the sequence. Anyway, understand, nearly ready for divorce. They, they talked about it. They, we just can't manage this. It was too much. And I said, well, okay, let me sit down with you and I'll work through this with you and I'll supervise your conversation and uh, mediate and let's see what happens. In 15 minutes, we had a solution. 15 minutes. They went away with that solution and I never saw them again until I got a phone call nearly two years later. And they rang up and said, oh, do you remember us? I said, no, I talked to a lot of people. Tell me. And they said, oh, well, that was this situation. They said, oh. I said, we got that solution in 15 minutes. How's it working? It's still working. We're still together. We've, we've changed as people. Thank you for your time. And that was the end of the conversation. Now, you don't get that very often. People leave and they get a solution, like a doctor who does something, you never talk to him again, yet he's saved your life, you know? Here's the solution. First of all, they had to, and I'll just follow this plan. First of all, they had to download the emotional content of both parties, because you cannot... Resolve a conflict when people are uptight emotionally and they can't talk. Or else they just yell or they avoid, whatever. So we went through a situation of finding the content of their problem, which is the factual stuff, the feelings that they had, and then the meaning of that to both of them. And for her, the issue was content, I need to have my husband communicate with me and help me and all this sort of stuff and we, we become a partnership. And her feeling, she was angry because she felt rejected whatever. And, and the meaning was he didn't love her. For him, his deal was, well, when I get home, I'm people out. I'm going to have time away from people. And when I get home, I'm really not home. Not till I re regenerate or renew. And his, his feelings were strong and angry that she couldn't clean up the place. And then the meaning for her was finally that, uh, for him, was that she just didn't respect him at all. She, she really just disregarded his, his comments and feelings and what his needs were. So when you define that content, feeling and meaning, and both people have shared, one of the arts of that is when you share... The other person's got to stop before they answer and they're not to, not to defend anything. They are to repeat back to the person in their own words what they've heard in content, feeling and meaning. And the issue is at the end of that, both parties feel, oh, I can let that go now because my partner has understood and verified that he's understood or she is. Secondly, define the concern in terms of needs, not solutions. You see, the issue is there's a thousand solutions. I have people come in and say in marriage counselling, can we solve the problem of our relationship? I said, is, you know, is there a solution? I said, there's many solutions, but they're not solutions for you unless they meet your needs. Because a solution has got to meet the needs of the person. And so in the content feeling of meaning, people have actually put down some of the needs. So you say, well, hey, what is your need? What is your need? His need was to have space when he got home away from people. Her need was to have involvement of her husband. And then I brainstormed with them and got them to put down some ideas. And then the last part's very obvious. You know, when you've got a solution that meets the needs, then you assign responsibilities and then you implement the plan and come back and evaluate and see how you're going. Here's what the solution was to the problem. 
he would come home. Well, first of all, before he came home, she designed the arrangement so there was one room in the house where he could come home and actually have a quiet time reading the paper, having a coffee, whatever it was, for whatever time was needed. And that was, he just walked straight in, not worry about the stuff, and straight into that room. And for him, that was his safe place when he got home. No one, you know, hammering with ideas or come here and do the... Okay, so that was the first thing. And she'd make him a cup of coffee and she came to the conclusion, I can't think that he's home, I just basically do that, he goes into there and he is actually home when he finishes in that room. Not bad. And you can think, well, he's got all he wants. Now the other side was, for her, she would then, when he came out, he would now take some responsibility with the kids to clean up the mess, put the stuff away and help bath the kids and all this sort of stuff and prepare tea, whatever. Right? And at the end of that, when they work together, she could have a bit of space while he does that from the kids and then after tea, they would sit down and talk with each other as how their day has been. That worked for them for two years, still working for them. What a simple solution. And yet they were ready to divorce on that. So what I'm saying to you, when you look at the summary, culture of honour, we have to develop that in our family, in the church, uh, in our marriage, because it won't work unless there's a culture of honour. And when you really inspect what people think about their partner, usually the problems they've faced and their, whatever it is has stereotyped their view as to who this person is. And they've lost their first love. Same in the church. Same in family. But when you come to the issue of how we should treat each other, all of those things that we say we could do, when that starts to become a behavioural response, then we're ready to actually implement an issue of how do we resolve conflict and come to an elegant solution that works for both parties. This is the way it has to happen. And I say at the end of the day, the more we can get people to operate on what's contained in these notes, the better will be the community of the church, better will be marriages, better will be families. And when you introduce the power of the Spirit in your lives to help us transform in these areas and give us the willingness to actually participate in what looks like a long process but becomes very short when you understand how to enact it, then you can make progress. Then you have a marriage that you want to be in, then you have a family that can be under the control of God in a biblical sort of sense and then you can have a church that when people come into it, they will experience that safety, that honouring, the privilege of being a part of a fellowship that glorifies God, that encourages people to move forward in their faith. That's what it's all about. It's a big picture view. There's enough contained in here to transform a church, a family and a marriage if people were willing to actually implement it. And so after 40 years of counselling and marriage counselling, there are a lot of keys in there. Of course, if people have other issues, medical issues, physical issues, you've got to get people to address those, but this is the relationship side. And if you're serious about that and you want to move forward, I'd be happy to talk to anyone about that and and even sit with you to help you try and resolve and look at the issues that need to be looked at with the hope that you would come up to an outcome which is elegant, solution to problems and issues, one that glorifies God. Let me just pray. And I've taken a prayer by Charles Swindoll. My wife handed it to me from use in her group. But let me just pray this prayer. I think it's a really powerful prayer in relation to what we've been talking to God about let's pray almighty god we reflect on your character as we seek wisdom for such a time as this in these moments of fear you remain perfect love in these unsafe days you remain all powerful and able to protect in these uncertain times you remain all knowing leading us aright In the unprecedented pandemic we're facing, you remain absolutely sovereign. Our times are in your hands. 
Therefore, our dependence on you is total, not partial. Our need for your forgiveness is constant, not occasional. Our gratitude for your grace is profound, not casual. And our love for you is deep, not shallow. We ask that you guard and guide our leaders. May uncompromising integrity mark their lives. We also ask that you unite us us as one body, committed to turning our world upside down with love. Equip us with genuine humility and heartfelt compassion. Remind us that we are not alone, that we are yours, that you live in us, and that through us you make known the full expression of your love. May that love heal our land and change our world. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Pray for us this week. Um, At the moment, I hope this was coherent this morning because uh, I think Lyrica as a nerve drug (laughs) spaces you out. uh, But pray for us. I go into surgery first thing tomorrow morning. Okay, let's conclude the service.